Welcome to lesson 27 of industrial automation and control. In this lecture, we will first look, look at pressure and flow control valves, something which spilled over from the last lecture. Then look at hydraulic cylinders, proportional valves and servo valves. And finally, we will look at uh, the structure of a full you know hydraulic actuation system. So, we look at the instruction objectives, describe the principles of operation of pressure and flow control valves and cylinders, basic components of proportional valves, learn about basic components of servo valves and be familiar with the typical you know control architecture of uh, hydraulic actuation systems. This, these are the instructional objectives of this lesson. <coughs> so, coming over from the last lesson, pressure relief valves. These are, uh, these valves are typically mounted. So, you have, these are not valves where these are connected in parallel in general. That is, uh, you have a pipe through which the main flow takes place and this valve is going to be connected in parallel. Okay. So, in a, in a hydraulic circuit you will have the main line and you will have a pressure relief valve connected to typically to tank. So, this will be the valve symbol as shown and there is an adjustable spring. So, the main power line through which the main fluid flows will be this. If the pressure at this point goes high, then this valve is supposed to operate. So, this point A is connected to the inlet A and this point B is connected to the drain B. Okay. So, if the pressure goes high here, this is a simply a poppet like thing, this one which is loaded by this spring. This is a spring, you can see the cross section. So, the spring actually presses it down, the spring presses it down. So, when it presses it down, this is closed, but if the pressure at this point pressure goes high, then this will be pushed up, this will be pushed up and the fluid will flow through this to the drain. It will flow through this to the drain. So, that is the path, this path. This is the operation of the pressure relief valve. Now, sometimes you need to operate these relief valves in various modes uh, using a pilot. That is a pilot is a pilot is a line from using which by applying pressure from a remote place you can operate a valve. So, the, there may be some normal operation mode of the valve, but you, you may sometimes the, the, the operator may like to override that mode and get into a different mode and that he can do sitting in the control room while the valve may be at the field somewhere near the machine. So, here we have a pilot operated valve, see the operation. So, this is the pilot port, right? suppose first of all we keep it closed. So, if we keep it closed, suppose it is sealed. So, normally fluid is flowing through this, going out through this or rather uh, opposite, it is going, uh, yeah, it is it's going through this and because of this, it will actually what happens is that the fluid is flowing through this tank and going out. Now, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, actually right, right, correct. So, this fluid is going through this like this, this is the inlet port and this is the outlet port. And there is a, you see that this, this is, sol this is so actually hollow, but so, and there is a slight hole here, slight capillary like opening which is not shown, I am making it full. 
So, what happens is that the pressure here is generally in the steady state it is the same as the pressure here. So, on this pool on this pool the net force is 0. So, but there is a spring this is a spring. So, the spring is pushing it down. So, this edge these two edges they are actually pressing against here and closing. So, there is no leakage to tank directly the fluid is passing this is the this is the normal scenario. Now, suppose the pressure goes starts going high here. So, what will happen is that slowly because of the capillary it will take some time, but the pressure here and pressure here after some time are maintained because of this opening. So, the pressure here will also go up in this way at some time the pressure here will go so high that it will push this poppet on this direction and there will be a leakage flow. This this is actually a hollow can you see these dotted lines this indicates that it is hollow and there is an opening. So, the fluid will start flowing through this hollow and it will flow out to the tank. So, so the pressure cannot increase beyond a certain level. Now, suppose you want to at, at, at some points of time due to the operational requirements you want to open this valve before that if you if you st now uh, if you st try to make it flow through this it will not flow because it will close. So, there cannot be any tank to pump flow on the other hand if you now apply a pilot pressure here if you apply a pilot pressure here for example, you see you, you can apply pilot pressure using a directional valve. So, in this position of the valve pump is connected to B. So, in this ah, this is so in this position uh, what will what is going to happen is that because you are applying pressure here. So, you are pushing this. So, you are pushing this down. So, you are pushing this down. So, the pump can be pump will flow to tank this will flow to tank. So, you can now have you can by, by applying a certain amount of pressure you can decide the level of pressure at which this will drain to tank. So, so the relief level can be programmed. So, such things can be done using pilot operated relief valves. Going over to the next one flow control valves. These are valves which are made such that the flow across them irrespective of irrespective of the pressure variation irrespective of the pressure variation at the inlet the flow through the outlet is going to be constant and this can be adjusted by this I mean there can be different settings of flow and one can adjust that setting. So, how is that achieved this is achieved basically by the fact that this is the inlet port. So, what is the fluid path the fluid path is through this through this through this through this through like this this is the fluid path ok. So, there are two obstructions one obstruction is this one this one this is a, this is actually a cross sectional view. So, the actual thing is like this it is it is a it is a cylinder with a notch with a with a with a V shaped notch in the middle. So, you can see that the amount of so because the notch, the notch is V shaped. So, if this is rotated if this is rotated then the ends of the V will come here it will become like this this crescent will become like this. Then the fluid has to flow through this much of opening right now it is flowing through this much of so actually because the cross section varies here the cross section is low here the cross section is more here the cross section is maximum. So, as you rotate it this 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 cross sectional area through which this flows can be determined this is the first thing. So, so the flow setting can be adjusted by moving this valve moving this notch. Now, what happens is that suppose the pressure here goes up if it goes up then 
because it is flowing at a certain across a particular notch there is a particular pressure drop at a particular flow. So, this pressure will immediately tend to rise here. Now, if the when the pressure rises this will apply a force. If this applies a force then No, actually what will happen is that if the pressure rises here then the then, then first the pressure will rise here. Now, uh, this means that this pressure will act the pressure will also so the so, so the flow will tend to because of that the flow will tend to increase here. But because the pressure rises here so, so the flow will this pressure will pressurize it here and here. So, that this pool will move this side. Now, if this pool moves this side you can understand that this opening will close. Once this opening closes then there is going to be a greater pressure drop here and naturally since this pressure drop is fixed it has gone up, but at this level it is fixed. Then if you increase the pressure drop here then the pressure here will fall. So, in this way the pressure is going to be adjusted there is going to be this will stay a particular flow will take place when the pressure difference between these two what is the pressure difference between these two why is this in equilibrium because there is an upward pressure here there is a downward pressure here and there is a spring force which is downward. So, it will so the difference between this pressure and this pressure in any steady state is always going to be equal to the spring therefore, the spring sets the pressure difference across the throttle. So, it is set by the spring it is always be equal to the spring force and so now so so what is going to happen is that at a, at a particular opening of the v notch if you have the pressure difference fixed and if you have the opening cross section fixed then the flow is going to be fixed so this is the way that so so the moment the pressure goes up the this throt this pool will adjust and control the pressure here such that the flow will flow to the load is going to be to, going to remain the same. So, this is the principle of flow control valves. Now, we look at so finally, so now we have studied a number of valves right. So, we have first studied pumps and motors which deliver the fluid and finally, use the fluid motor is rotary actuator. Then we have seen how the fluid can be its directions can be changed and on its path how flow and pressure can be controlled. So, now finally, that fluid will go to a go to an actuator. So, one of the actuators can be a rotary actuator is motor which we have already studied. Now, we are going to see a linear actuator which is a cylinder. So, cylinders are generally of two types one type is called single acting the other type is called double acting. So, single acting means that it by force it moves only in one direction then it then it generally comes back either by gravity or by spring force etcetera while double acting means that by force it can be moved in both directions. So, for single acting generally the return uh, stroke is not loaded while the uh, forward stroke is loaded while for double acting both strokes can be loaded. It is very simple single acting cylinder this is a this is a single acting cylinder. So, if you put some pressure from the pump it will go up it will create a force and it will go up. So, that is the power stroke going up on the other hand if you connect it to tank in this case it is by gravity. So, so because of the load this this thing will come up and the fluid will be pushed out to the tank. So, if you want to have the power stroke you have to connect it to pump if you want to have the retraction stroke you have, you have to connect it to tank. For double acting cylinders are also very simple devices. So, here you can see that you can the you have two ports one is pump one other is tank you actually you have two ports. So, one of the, so if you connect this one to pump and this one to tank then the fluid will enter here and will go out here and will be pushed in this direction 
on the other hand if you reverse that if you take this one to pump and this one to tank then fluid will enter here and will go out through this direction. Only one thing to note is that the for the pressure that you will be required to move this that is the uh, we want to mention that this cross sectional areas are different on the two sides if you have this is called a single rod that is the rod to which the load is connected is connected only on one side. So, therefore, this area is going to be less than this area A 1 and A 2. So, A 2 is greater than A 1. If you have a double rod cylinder where you have a rod on this side also then it may be that A 2 is equal to A 1 or even A 2 can be less than A 1. So, this is a very simple device. Now, so, so far we have we have mostly seen apart from pressure control and flow control we have mostly seen uh, valves where the direction of the fluid is changed. So, we have seen mainly directional valves. Now, we are going to look at some valves where the flow or pressure can be controlled in a continuous or a stepless manner. Okay. So, it is so therefore, we use what are known as proportional and servo valves. So, you have here what the I mean the advantages are that you have a stepless control of position, force, velocity, etcetera, and you can drive these, these are typically electro hydraulic valves, so that you can drive them uh, accurately using mainly using current and uh, so that you can you can sometimes have computing interfaces one of the major areas of application is avionics so the onboard flight computer will drive these actuators such that the plane can flow can fly so obviously you use hydraulics for high power weight ratio sometimes you can improve the power weight ratio and drive very high loads using multiple stages of hydraulics and they use open uh, partially open or partially closed and on sometimes full closed loop control. So, these are generally very precise devices quite expensive difficult to make manufacture and mainly used for moving for precision motion of very high power loads. So, we will start with proportional valves. So, we can have open loop technology where we when can you use open loop control? You can use open loop control when this we have studied in in control theory that why do you need feedback? You need feedback when you know that the system model can change and there are lots of unknown disturbances. So, if you have this sort of situations then you use closed loop feedback control, but in a situation, but for closed loop feedback control you need you need you may need an expensive feedback arrangement. So, if you can sometimes do away with that if you know that your system is highly stable does not change there is little uncertainty very well characterized and you know the load. So, there is not going to be an, an unexpected kind of load in, in such a situation you can use open loop control and typically in a in a control system there may there may be multiple loops. So, you if you have some of the loops closed and the may be the maybe the final in these are generally used for creating motion. So, maybe the if the final motion of the final element is not sensed then I call it a partial closed loop control. So, proportional valves use this open or partial closed loop control and they are very highly characterized devices. So, basic idea is to create flow or pressure proportional to spool stroke. So, the, so basically there is a it is it is like a it is like a directional valve only only thing is that in the in directional valves when you switch on one side of the solenoid it comes and sticks at one end when you energize the other side of the solenoid it comes and sticks at the other end here you are not going to do that here you are going to make make continuous motion of the spool and so all these openings are going to open to various extents and thereby you are going to control the flow or the pressure. 
So, you are basically, so basically the structure is the same. So, by it creates flow or pressure proportional to spool stroke. So, it is so the flow or pressure will be proportional to the uh, motion of the spool and this will in turn create proportional force or speed at the actuator depending on what the actuator is. Let us consider a linear actuator at this point of time and as we have seen that in the as we said that in the pilot operated relief valve you can you can control the pressure at which the valve will vent. So, how do you do that? You do that by controlling the pilot pressure. How do you control the pilot pressure? You can put a proportional uh, valve at the from the pump and then connect the outlet of that pump uh, of that valve to the pilot port of the relief valve and then by using computer or using I mean using manual operation you can control the relief pressure. A typical proportional valve will have these elements. So, it is it, it is operated by a control voltage which can be given manually or which can come from a computer. Then, then there is usually a set of electronic circuits which do various kinds of things which do filtering, uh, which will do amplification which can do sometimes if part of it is digital they will do digital to analog conversion and there can there, there is a main thing is that it must add some power that is there will be a servo amplifier and there will be a voltage to current converter. So, finally, from this control voltage which does not have any power you are going to drive some current. This current will be applied to a proportional solenoid. So, the characteristic of the proportional solenoid is such that at a particular current it can create a particular force. So, if it can create, create a particular force or, or it can create a particular stroke as we shall see that proportional valves can be either force controlled or stroke controlled. So, if you control the stroke then the hydro the, this is the this is the coil part of it this is these are that is why these are called electro hydraulic. So, this part is electrical electrical this is the hydraulics. So, if you create a force or stroke on the spool you will get a corresponding flow or pressure and that flow or pressure can be applied to us to the this is the actuator finally, which is connected to the actual load which you want to move machine. So, this is the cylinder or the motor. So, so these are the these are the, these are typical structure of a proportional valve. So, proportional solenoids are typically made if you want to have a force controlled proportional solenoid proportional valve then what you do is that you do actually how do you do force control you do current control and you do current control and then you have made the solenoid such that it is this is force stroke characteristic. So, you see that for a good range of the stroke the force remains constant at a given current. So, by changing the current you can take the force up and it will take it will it will stay constant over a length of the stroke. In fact, it should be mentioned that these valves the stroke length is actually very small it is of the order of millimeters full stroke length. So, therefore, uh, generally the stroke length is not large and therefore, the, the, the valve is actually expected to operate only in this zone. So, you have a constant current to force ratio. Uh, so, so therefore, if you want to have if you want to control the force it is equivalent to control the current which is very simple as we have as we will see later also that current feedback is is very much preferred because it is very easy to uh, get that feedback. For example, a typical very cheap Hall effect sensor can give you a very good current feedback sometimes a current sensing resistance you can drive the current through a small resistance and then take the voltage drop that will give you very good current value. So, that brings down the cost if you really wanted to on the other hand remember that this force control strategy will is essentially dependent on this force current characteristics of this valve. So, that must be ensured and if it is not good enough then your force is not going to stay constant. On the other hand if you have whether you have uh, 
stroke control oh we have not uh, drawn the stroke control let me just go ahead and uh, actually i on the other hand uh, yeah okay so go back okay so you see that this is a i'm sorry yeah so typically typical typical construction of a force controlled um, proportional valve so what you are happening is that you see here you are giving the electrical connection that is the servo amplifier current has to be driven here that will will this is a this is the torque so called torque motor so what will happen is that it will this is the connector so if you drive the current then what will happen is that say this will move this magnet system will pull it and it will tilt slightly so it will push it it will push it here once it pushes this is actually connected this is this is actually connected so once this pushes this valve will shift this is the spool you can see the spool this is the spool shaft so once this moves this side this is the pump which gets connected to this port and this is that this port gets connected to the tank okay on the other hand if you connect if you move it this way then this will get connected to this port and this will get connected to this port so this will make the spool shift in this case because of this feedback it will move a certain only only a certain distance in the case of so you see that in the case of force control in the case of uh, stroke control solenoids you actually put a position transducer so you actually put a position transducer and see the stroke and you give feedback in that case you can see that this this characteristic of the because it's a feedback system so therefore the characteristic of the valve need not be very closely controlled but the position transducer accuracy is very important and the characteristic of the overall proportional solenoid is going to be uh, still still going to be fairly constant okay so now so this is a you know this is a this is a typical application circuit what we are trying to do is this is a this is a single acting cylinder so you can see that if it is in this position then the then the cylinder is locked you can see that this is a cylinder so the cylinder is locked why the cylinder is locked the cylinder is locked because of this relief valve see this is a check valve so flow cannot take place from this place to this place if flow has to take place through this path then a certain pressure difference is required so unless the weight so the, so the cylinder cannot come back by its own weight because the fluid cannot go out of this chamber so if you put it in the central position of this four way valve three position four way valve then the cylinder is locked and it does not slowly come down because of its own weight on the other hand if you connect it to this position this means that these symbols mean that this is it, that these are proportional directional valves so it's not only that the it's not only that the position of the valve can be shifted to one of the three as is commonly known in directional valves the flow rate or can also be changed by using proportional control so the rest is simple if you connect it this place the fluid will flow into this and will flow through the valve on the other hand if you connect it to this position then the fluid will flow through this to the check valve and go to this and come back to the tank to the tank 
So, this is so you see that here you by using this proportional directional valve using only one element you are able to not only control the direction, but also control the velocity or the speed by using the proportional valve that is sometimes an advantage. Now, let us come to servo valves. They are they were typically developed for aviation applications because in aviation you have to make very precise movements of this of this of this control surfaces of the aircraft against very heavy load which is aerodynamic because the aircraft is moving at huge speed through the atmosphere. So, very precise motion has to be created against high load it is for these purposes that these servo valves were originally developed. Uh, it is a total closed loop control technology because you do not want the characteristic to change everything is very tuned and uh, well you have all the previous uh, advantages like electric drive accuracy computing interface flexibility programmability and hydraulics for high power weight ratio. So, the what is the what is, what is the basic idea see see a very typical uh, very simple type of servo valve. So, what is happening here? is that suppose you shift this this rod ok. So, if you pull this lever it will move this way as it moves this way what is going to happen that this port it will be connected to this and the tanks are at the end Actually, you can imagine that the tanks are here. So, the return stroke is going to be controlled going to the tank this is the way the fluid will flow. Now, interesting thing is where is the feedback interesting thing is that the, the load is connected to the body. So, if you are pulled it pulled the spool this side the cylinder will move which side it will move this side. So, the load will also move this side and the load is connected to the body. So, now the body will also move this side this body the not the spool the, the spool is connected to the lever and the body is connected to the load. So, the body will move. So, the movement of the body is actually like a relatively like a movement of the spool in the other direction because the flow the opening is actually by relative motion. So, if the body also moves in this direction again this flow this valve will close. So, you see that are there are a particular position of the piston or a position of the load this flow will again close till it closes there is going to be flow and there is going to be velocity and this load will keep moving this way. So, if you move the move the lever the valve is going to move in one direction and then finally, come and stop that is by feedback. Okay. So, this this is the this is so this is a typical you know very simple mechanical arrangement servo valve right. There are various types of servo valves for example, you one may have a two stage valve right. So, what happens in a what happens in a two stage valve in a two because you are you are you want to control huge power. So, the final stage valve is actually very large. So, even to move its spool you need another servo valve. So, you see what is happening you need an actuator. So, this is the first stage uh, uh, So, this is the first stage. So, you give actually your control input here. So, accordingly if you move it if you push it this way then this port will open and this port will open. So, the cylinder will move down when it moves down when it moves down then what is going to happen is that this will get connected to this and this will get connected to this. So, this is the main valve this is the pilot valve that is it is a valve which drives another valve just like you know a pilot rides in front of a car that is a pilot car 
So, the pilot is actually the leader which who drives. So, in this way this is the driving valve and this is the driven valve and this in turn this ports may be connected these two ports A and B may be will be connected to the main actuator which may be a very heavy load right. So, this way you get power amplification. So, here is a here is a typical type of two stage servo valve construction see what is happening. You have two kinds of pressure note first. So, first of all you have where, where is the main valve and where is the pilot valve. So, this is the pilot valve and this is the main valve this is the first thing to note. Who moves the pilot valve? This solenoid. Actually, this is connected to the spool, which is not shown. So, let us identify the parts, right? And so, what happens is that suppose you tilt the solenoid, something like a torque motor arrangement, which we will see what it is. This will push this valve this way. Now, you see that there is a there is a control pressure. So, the control pressure will come and this valve will move to this end. So, the pressure will fall here come here and come here and come here and create a pressure here. So, you see that here what is the pressure? Here the pressure is P C. P C. But here the pressure is not P C because it has to drop through this valve. So, this is going to be less than P C. In fact, so then if this side is P C and if there is and if this side is less than P C and still this has to move this way, then the net force here has to be more than the net force here. Therefore, the areas must be controlled. So, the area here is actually twice A and the area here is A. So, the so for moving this pressure is only required to be P C by 2, the pressure here is only required to be P C by 2. So, the moment this rises above P C by 2, this valve will shift this way. Now, when this valve will shift this way, you see that this is the final actuator, this is the motor. So, then when this valve will move this way, then what will happen is that probably this port will get connected to here and this port will get connected to here. So, then you will get pump and tank connected to the motor. Now, where is the feedback? The feedback is here in this thing, this is the feedback element. So, this spool is going to push this thing this way. When it pushes, here is a fulcrum. See, fulcrum. So, this will again push the spool, not the spool, the sleeve. So, the spool is being pushed by this one, and this, this one, this feedback element pushes the sleeves. So, it is going to push the sleeves this way. So, again the relative motion this, this motion of the sleeve will nullify the relative motion of the spool which was created by the current. So, again at a certain position at a certain at a certain gap again this will become P C by 2. So, so now the when the moment it becomes C C by 2 there is no force on this and it will come to so, it is at that position that now when it comes to stop then there is a certain amount of opening here and depending on that the so, so when you have a certain amount of opening you have certain amount of flow you have certain amount of pressure so you are so you are going to drive the motor at that flow rate or that speed. So, this is the operation of the two stage servo valve.
this shows that this this shows this is a slight little analysis of that feedback arrangement that is if the suppose you have this is this is a this is a valve and this is an actuator and there is a there is a connecting link so you give an input motion here what will happen this will initially shift this way the moment this shift this way what happens is that the pump connects to this and the tank connects to this so the actuator moves this way when the actuator moves this way the w moves this way and that will tend to keep it put it up so it so the cause that was created the effect will nullify the cause that's why it's a negative feedback situation and it's stable so if you want to analyze the motion of this z which finally creates the flow then you have to understand that then you have to look at it like this so you see that first when you you imagine that first there are there are actually two inputs and this is the motion that you want to analyze so first of all you you apply superposition so first of all you apply assume that w is zero and x is applied so then the this rod is going to move about this because the, because w is zero so so pivoted to this that will create some motion next you imagine that x is fixed and w is moving so now now you imagine that it's moving like this about x so this is so if you can for small motions you can imagine that that these two motions are the motions which will be created and the net motion is going to be a resultant of that so now you can understand so if w is a fulcrum and if x is applied if an amount x is applied then what is going to be the motion here right so that's going to be uh, that's going to be b by a plus b into x on the other hand if you apply fi fix it here and apply a motion y here this is y then what is going to be the motion here it's going to be a by b into w suppose w is the motion here so finally you get so for what is the final motion z so you have you have an effective feedback arrangement where what is coming this is the motion created by the motion x this is the motion created by the feedback w and this is the net motion z at any point of time and that is going to create so so a motion creates a flow and this is the flow gain so that is going to create a volumetric flow that divided by ap will give you the linear motion ap is the area of the piston that integrated 1 by s will give you the motion of the plane w so this is the control system that is effective and here is the transfer function so the transfer function between you can see that now that the transfer function between y by x is actually in the in the steady state s is going to go to zero so it's going to be a plus b by a and it will act like a first order transfer function so this is the this is the basic dynamics of any feedback of you you have seen various kinds of you know link linkage type of feedback arrangements so this is a basic analysis of one such feedback arrangement and in a typical case such analysis can be made next we see another type of servo valve which is a flapper type servo valve so so you see what's happening here what is happening here is that again here the this is the valve the valve is being moved by applying pressure here or pressure here so you have to create a differential pressure how do you create that pressure as such this is also this, this is a 1000 psi this is a you know restrictor so it's a pressure reducing valve so simply a series of obstruction so the pressure will while flowing the pressure will drop here and it will be something like 500 psi at these two ends when the this is a flapper nozzle okay so when if the if there is a minuscule motion of this flapper then the pressure at this point is going to rise if it's this side and the pressure at this side is going to fall so that will create a differential pressure and it will move the spool there is this, this is the basic principle and how do you create this motion 
you create this motion by what is known as the torque motor coil. So, you have a what sometimes called is called a torquer or sometimes called a torque motor which can create a minuscule motion of this flapper. The advantage of flapper nozzles is that their gain is very high, there is very small motion can create a very high pressure difference. So, that is so they are very sensitive devices. The next is a so you here you see get to see the uh, construction of the torquer. So, you see that this is the construction of the torquer. So, when what happens is that you create an S pole here and an N pole here and N pole here S pole that that is the way it is wound. So, and so what happens is that now you have this pole shoe. So, if you send currents like this then this is going to repel and this is going to attract. So, this torquer will slightly tilt it will slightly tilt and it is this tilt which will be this is connected this is the flapper flapper plate. So, this is the way you you uh, control the flapper. This is a picture, you know. Moog is a very is a, is a company which is a very well known manufacturer of such valves. So this is just a picture from their website. This is a cross-sectional view of a you know direct drive valve. So you have so you can see that the various parts. This is the electronics. This is the actual sir, valve and this is the what is known as the coil which will pull the spool and here is the position sensor which is typically an LVDT. Uh, you sometimes have a spring here and this is where you make the connection. So, this is these are just to show you the various parts the actual geometric how they are packed into a waste there they, these are very very compact devices. How do you do closed loop position control? So, very simple this is a see, see this, is a, this is a position loop. So, you have a proportional or servo valve here that is driven by this electronics and moves the load this is the cylinder which the position of the load is sensed by the position sensor this is the position typically an LVDT sometimes a potentiometer could be a resolver if it is rotary and these two are compared this and the error is fed so standard position loop. This ramp generator is sometimes used because uh, the fact that you do not need to saturate the amplifier and you want to heavy loads should not be you cannot should not give jerks to them that creates might create the damage to your equipment might give damage to the load. So, therefore, whenever a position signal has to be changed sometimes you, you, you need to control the rate at which it, it should go you never give step signals generally to these kind of systems. So, you have a ramp generator if you want to go from one system to another you go slowly through a ramp which depends on the velocity level that you want to have on this uh, load. This is a block diagram arrangement uh, of the of the valve of that loop. So you see that this these are the these are the these are the electrical gains. These are the electrical circuit gains. This is the sensor gain. This is the valve gain. So this is this is current. This is the current to flow characteristic KQ of the valve. So, when you have a certain flow uh, then that flow is going in. So, flow by area will give you velocity and velocity by integrated will give you position. This is like a block diagram. Similarly, the flow that you are having this which you are find assuming that is going through because of your nominal value of k q that you know sometimes that this flow can be 
slightly changed if the supply pressure of the pump changes. So to model that they have put a pressure disturbance block. So if you want to because these are you know uh, I am sorry because these are very precision control devices generally. So this uh, it is important to understand the dynamics because there is so much load acting on it that uh, so much force acting on it that this dynamics can actually affect for example in an aircraft the dynamics of the actuator is very important. So in an electro hydraulic aerospace actuator you have you have a you have a similar block so you use you, you can see that you have this is the final say control surface this is a typical actuator used in aerospace very precision actuators. This is the cylinder which is sometimes called a ram this is so the cylinder is driven by a servo valve the servo valve is driven by a force motor and the force motor this is the coil which drives the spool of the valve and that is driven by uh, by the electronics and the servo amplifier. So there are various feedbacks there is a current feedback which is uh, which is inside this which is inside this force motor current is sensed and fed back beyond here. Then there is a spool position feedback of the hydraulic servo valve spool and finally there is a ramp position feedback of the of the actual control surface. So these are connected in cascade loops. You can see the we will uh, not do it in much detail but the typical drive electronics. So you use all that I wanted to show is that you have to there are certain elements for example you have to use servo amplifiers and V2I converters and then you need various kinds of filters because specifically because you do not you want to avoid giving uh, inputs to your uh, system which may cause things like resonance. So for that from that point of view you have to uh, you have to cut out certain frequencies in your input and that is why you need various kinds of notch filters. So this is this name is a load resonance notch. So if you are carrying molten steel using a hydraulic system then there is there is, there is certain natural frequency if you give input at that frequency then the molten st steel will spill over. So you have to cut out that frequency so that as you are transferring there will be no there will be no waves created in the liquid steel or whatever. For these purposes certain frequencies of inputs must be cut out. So this is a typical uh, oops. If you see the spool dynamics it is very simple there is some force acting on the spool which is created by the coil uh, this creates, creates a certain amount of acceleration. So this is acceleration this is velocity so you have friction feedback and then this finally spool position and you have two kinds of feedback one is that you can have a spring sometimes you know, we have seen that we have centering springs connected. So you have spring force and you have a Bernoulli force which is which is occurring or which is a force on the spool because of that fluid flowing through the valve. So there is some force acting on the spool so these act as feedback elements so this creates the motion of the spool. Similarly in the ram. The, the, the motion of the spool the flow into the ram depends on this the depends on the supply pressure and the spool. So you see that this is the inlet fluid into the ram and what is the outlet fluid if the motion of the ram is x ram and this is the area of the cylinder then this is the fluid which is going out. So there is a little difference finally and that difference actually causes the, what creates the force the force is created by the compression of the fluid. So initially there is a little fluid fluid, fluid compression and, and because the bulk modulus is so high so that immediately creates a lot of uh, pressure and that multiplied by area so you get the force that is the acting force on the cylinder there is a load on the cylinder also. So the difference actually accelerates the cylinder and creates the motion. So this is the kind of dynamics that you have on hydraulic cylinders and they have to be precisely controlled. So we have come to the end of the lesson we have seen flow pressure and control valves we have seen hydraulic cylinders proportional valves servo valves and some hydraulic actuation systems.
last points to ponder yeah what is the difference between a salvo valve and a proportional valve is it in terms of feedback is it in terms of performance accuracy is it in terms of structure drive what identify the major components of a hydraulic actuation system this is one of the major this question you should be able to answer because this is one of the basic purposes basic instructional objectives sketch the construction of a two stage servo valve this is going to take some time but think about it how it works especially how the feedback come works why are pilot operation of valves needed can you think of some actual application and explain the operation of a flow control valve that is interesting how the flow is controlled irrespective of pressure variation by a mechanical arrangement. So, that brings us to the end of our co uh, lesson today thank you very much. Welcome to lesson 28 of industrial automation and control course under the NPTEL program. Today we are uh, we are going to look at a very interesting topic. In the last two lectures we have seen various hydraulic system components. In this lecture we will see how they can be joined together to uh, form hydraulic circuits for various kinds of industrial applications. So, that is going to be very interesting for me at least to tell you. So, looking at the instructional objectives, after this lesson a student should be able to cite typical industrial actuation problems, some very common problems which occur in the case of uh, industrial systems. So, uh, then in many cases we you know energy is very expensive. So, we do we never like to uh, spend energy unnecessarily. So, there are various kinds of you know energy saving schemes especially hydraulic systems which are, are very high power systems. So, saving energy is important. So, we will see how we can save energy for such systems and sometimes we will find that we need to you know we need to create motions using hydraulic systems. So, we need to adjust speeds, we need to adjust forces depending on the requirement of the load. So, how to do them <coughs> and finally, we all these circuits will draw using some using specific hydraulic symbols. So, we will we'll, we'll see in the course of this lesson how to uh, interpret hydraulic symbols, how to understand what components are being used and how to figure out how uh, hydraulic circuits work from a, from, a, from a circuit diagram. 